life of He Lives. Hey, Colin. Ooh, there, wait, wait for it, wait for it. They figured it out. Awesome. All right, guys. So this morning, I've got like a lot of ground to cover. Usually, I start off by telling a story that makes you guys feel nice and relaxed, you know, and this morning, I don't really have time for that because I've got like, I've got the verse that I want to talk about, and then we've got six verses before then that set up the part that I want to talk about. So what we're going to do is we're literally going to jump right into it right now. So if you have an actual Bible present, which first row, see you, gold star, uh, congrats. You're one of like 10 people that still brings a Bible to church for everyone else. We've got them on the screen. We're going to start in John chapter 12, and I'm going to be starting in verse 37. It says this, it says, but despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe in him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? But the people couldn't believe, for as Isaiah also said, the Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than the praise of God. Can we go ahead and pray real quick and then we'll get into this? God, thank you so much for this morning. Uh, truthfully, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I believe, I know to be true that when your word is spoken, when it is opened, the opportunity for something powerful, impactful, and eternity changing now becomes available. So this morning, I pray that as we look into your word, that you would reveal through your spirit to us what it is that you're trying to say, that we would understand you a little bit better as a result of this morning, and that we would draw closer to you as a result of what is said this morning, not for the glory of anyone here, but exclusively for the glory of Jesus. It's in his name, amen. Amen. Amen, church. So real quick, let's get into this before we get, like I said, to the goods. This is like the beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring where it's cool, but you know that some really cool stuff is coming your way soon. So this moment, it's, it's, called, uh, it's called, let's see, the heart, or it's preface to the heart of the issue. It's called the unbelief of the people. And it deals with the crowd that Jesus is getting ready to speak to here in just a moment. And the fact that they're having a hard time believing that Jesus is who he says that he is. See, in, in the times of the Old Testament, which is the Old Testament of the Bible, which is the only Bible that they would have had in this day, it is full of prophecy. And what prophecy is, is it's God talking through an anointed person, a prophet, to give a message to the people. So the Old Testament is chalked full of prophecy of a coming Messiah, that one day a Messiah is going to show up, here's the sign that he's gonna show up. And the Old Testament is full of them. And in the three years of Jesus' ministry and in the entirety of his life, it's like cross this one off, cross this one off, cross this one off, like he's filling them out, yet the people still don't believe. It's like if, if I gave you a brand new puzzle, Courtney Kelly, because I know Courtney really loves puzzles, if I were to give you a brand new puzzle and on the cover, it was Robert Downey Jr. like taking the wrinkles out of a shirt, it's an ironing man puzzle. And, and you open that puzzle and it's still sealed. You know, all the puzzle pieces are still in the box. You've got the image on the front, you've got the image on the paper and you take the time, probably with my wife, to assemble that puzzle. And afterwards you look at it and, and, and you see the image here and you see the image on the paper and you see the pieces that you've just put together and you go, hold on, this is not ironing man. No, what are you talking about? Like picture one, picture two, picture three, they're the same. What, like, what, what's not adding up here? That's what's happening in this moment. These people, this largely Jewish congregation, they would have been able to see all of these prophecies being fulfilled and they're still sitting there going, I don't think this is the Messiah we're looking for. It's like, what do you... It's all right here. Gee, like God in the Old Testament even accounts for that. Verse 40 is literally God calling his shot saying, look, I'm gonna send the Messiah. They're still not gonna believe in him and that's fine. And we see the reasoning behind why a lot of these people don't believe. See, some do believe, others don't believe. And then you've got like a third group of people that they do believe that when Jesus is like, hey, I'm the Messiah. They're like, yes, you are. And we believe it to be true. And then they look over and the Pharisees, the religious leaders are doing like the Michael Scott meme. You know, like they're just like, hey, 
He's not, remember, because the religious leaders don't want Jesus to be the Messiah because then they lose their power, they lose their authority. So like, yeah, you are the Messiah. Never mind, no, you're not. Because they loved their position. They loved their standing with the religious elite. So they said, no, no, I don't, I don't believe. This is the crowd this morning that Jesus is going to be speaking to, delivering what is called the final Notice, it's his final time speaking in front of a crowd before he goes to be with just his disciples before he is to be crucified. So bearing that in mind, bearing now the audience of that time, let's jump back into the two towers and return of the king of our morning. Verse 44, two people understood that and I, I'm, it's fine. Like I, I always, I tell jokes to small groups. I'm just trying to hit a bunch of them. Uh, <laughs> Jesus shouted to the crowds, if you trust me, you are trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey, for I've come to save the world and not to judge it. But all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth that I have spoken. I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I say whatever the father tells me to say. So like I said, this is the final notice. This is the last time that Jesus is speaking to the crowd. And it's interesting, like if we've, we've gone through 12 chapters now of the book of John in two years, great pace. Um, and Jesus isn't like imparting any new information. Like this isn't crazy, like revelatory stuff. This is not old news, but it's the same news that he's been preaching for three years. His message is redundant. And right off the bat, there's something that I think we need to take notice of because it will impact how we look at the rest of it. Verse 44 says, Jesus, worth it. What, what did Jesus do? What? Shouted. See, I grew up in the church and I grew up with like a precious moments view of Jesus. Like you guys know the precious moments dolls where like everything is soft and the colors are muted and there's nothing sharp or harsh about it. Like that was the Jesus I grew up picturing is that he walked like almost floating around and he spoke very softly and very lovingly always. And in this moment, Jesus changes tone just a little bit. The soft spokenness is gone. Why? Well, because Jesus knows it's his last time speaking in front of a group of people. See, I was listening to 610 Sports Radio to drive one day over the last couple weeks, and uh, he was interviewing a Chiefs player, and instead of asking football questions, he chose to ask, like, weird questions, and he asked an offensive lineman, hey, would you, would you like to know when you're going to die, or would you like to know how you're going to die? And this, like, 300-plus-pound man over the radio is thinking, like, uh, uh, maybe this, but then... Well, maybe that, I don't know, but like, I'd like to know what to avoid for the rest of my life. It'd be cool to know how much time I have left. And like, maybe Caleb Noah has a smart answer to this question, but most of us, this is like a difficult question. Like, I, I don't know. Jesus is shouting to the crowd because in this moment, he knows he's got three days and his death's about to hurt. He's gonna be crucified in three days. And this is his last chance to look at a crowd of largely skeptical people and impart in them something that will, they can hold on to after he's gone. So what I'm saying is this will preach itself. I'm just gonna talk through it for the next few minutes because Jesus is charged up in this moment. The next thing he says is, for when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. And this is important because in a largely religious crowd, in a largely Jewish crowd, they would be believing in the God of the Old Testament. And Jesus is trying to just reaffirm this. He's like, guys, I'm not saying God's not real. I'm not saying God doesn't exist. What I'm saying is when you see me, you're seeing him. The one you believe in is the same as the one you are seeing right now. You can trust the words that I'm speaking to you because I was just with the guy 34 years ago. And it's an important distinction. It's an important thing for us to understand because this verse 44 and verse 45, they, they show us that Jesus is exasperated because he knows it's his last time speaking to this group. 
And the first thing he does is say, look, I get it. You're skeptical, but trust me, I know him. He is me, I am him. Now let's listen to what Jesus has to say in his last moments to this group. Verse 46, he says, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I preached like six times and I, I don't know how to pace out when to take a drink of something. <laughs> I've come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. Why did Jesus come to earth? Jesus came to earth to be a light in the darkness. And I think it's an important thing to realize that God, you know, we say that like he stays the same through the ages and that like he never changes. It's proven in verse 46 right here because what God does is he does the same thing that he did way back at the very beginning of everything. Genesis 1 and verse 3, it says, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good. There are some theologians that, that they believe a quick sidebar, that the reason why the universe is still expanding is because at the beginning of everything, God said, let there be light, and then he never told it to stop. That's how powerful God is. He said, let there be light, just keep going. So in this moment, in creation, God sees the darkness, and he says, let there be light, and then he sees the light and says, the light is good. So Jesus is speaking to this largely Jewish crowd that would know what's going on in Genesis 1 and verse 3. It'd be brought to the front of their mind. And Jesus is trying to get them to understand that God is doing something new that's the same as what he did then, and it's good. That God is creating something, and the something that he is creating is good. Jesus himself says that believing in him means not having to walk in darkness, which poses like an interesting question. I think to this point, we can all agree, light is good. Jesus says that the light is good. Jesus has come to be a light. God said, let there be light, the light is good. If light is so good, what makes darkness so bad? If the light is, oh, hold on. Okay, so for like three seconds there, this ledge that I'm usually really, really comfortable with that I can hang my toesies over could have broken my leg. So like, that could be why the darkness is so bad. Um, my wife has the unfortunate privilege of being married to me, the light turn offer, because all throughout our house, all the time, day, night, doesn't matter. I'm like, cool, well, we don't need the kitchen light on because we're in the living room. Oh, we're in the living room. We don't need the living room light on. The TV's on and it's good enough. Oh, it's dark outside. The moon's a full moon. There's plenty of light coming in. Like, I'm the guy that is constantly just turning off lights in the house to my wife's pain, literally, because there has been a couple times in our year of marriage where we have lived in this same house and she has found things that live in our house indefinitely with like her toe or her knee or her shin. Because in the light, you can walk through your house no problem, but when it gets dark, it becomes a little more sus the closer you get to it. In the dark, your living room starts to get a little bit dangerous. And why is that? I believe it's because darkness gives power to things that aren't supposed to have power over you. Why did Jesus come to be a light? Because he knows that the darkness exists and the darkness exists to have power over your life that it does not deserve and it has not earned. Your social media, I'm gonna hit the usuals. Your friends, your workplace, your school, your church, your religion, you name it, it's not meant to make you vulnerable. And Jesus says, I have come to be a light. Darkness creates vulnerability. And if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, we, we, have, we have to realize that, that we're here to have an impact on our environment. Like we are here to walk in the light so that way when we see someone about to hit a couch with their shin, we can say, hey, watch out, dude. Like we are meant to impact our environment. We are not meant to be impacted by our environment. And Jesus gives like, 
arguably the simplest answer. And over the last few weeks, I've tried really, really hard to make it more complicated because I want you guys to think that I'm smart, but I'm not, and it's not. It's so simple. What is the antidote to walking in the darkness? It's just trusting Jesus. It is as simple as trusting in Jesus. But if we're not careful, we can leave it at like the religious platitude of like, oh, you're going through some stuff. Try trusting in Jesus. Cool. Try trusting in Jesus and we'll talk. <laughs> if someone doesn't know how to trust in Jesus, telling them to trust in Jesus isn't going to help them. So how, how do we trust in Jesus? What does it look like to trust in Jesus? Philippians 4, 6 through 7 gives us like a super, super simple field manual of how to trust in Jesus. This is the Apostle Paul. He's speaking to the church in Philippi. This is a time after Jesus has been crucified on the cross. And he has this to say, starting in verse 6. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and then thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which surpasses all understanding. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So what's, what's it start with? Don't worry, be happy. No. If you are a person of the 90s, you know that big mouth bass, when he swings his head around, it's, <laughs> don't worry, be happy. No, he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, counterpoint, here's what to do in lieu of worrying. Pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and then thank him for all he has done. So what does it look like to trust in Jesus? How do we trust in Jesus? It could not be more simple. Don't worry, pray. What does prayer looking like? You know that friend that you can vent to that's not gonna tell anyone all of the horrible things that you say? Like Jesus is like that with even less risk of anyone else finding out. If you've got something going on, can you talk to God about it? Have you stopped worrying for 30 seconds to pray to God about what's going on, to pray to God about your circumstance? Have you told him what is going on? And then lastly, have you been thankful for what he's already done? Because if you're here this morning, you've got a leg up. I promise things are gonna be okay. But when we choose the light, choosing the light, trusting in Jesus is as simple as don't worry, pray, talk to God, and thank God. Choosing to walk in Jesus' light means trusting him regardless of what that light illuminates. Because if you trust Jesus, he's going to reveal some things in your life that you may need to work on. He's going to reveal some couches that exist in the darkness of your life that instead of sitting comfortably on, you are stubbing your toe over and over because you won't turn on the light and see what's going on. Regardless, it doesn't matter what the light illuminates. What matters is that it is now illuminated and now is no longer a threat to your life that now it is in Jesus's hands. So this morning we've got a little bit of time left. I promise I'm gonna take more time than I have. But I, I, wanna, I wanna kind of bring things to a head because verse 47 is, is where we start to wind down and we start to see what Jesus has to say after that. He says that I've come as a light I am here on earth to be a light because it's a dark world. You are living in a dark world. To follow the light, to experience the light, to have the light is as simple as trusting me and you will no longer remain in the darkness. What does he have to say next? Verse 47, he says, I will not judge. 
I wish you had put a period right there. I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey. For I have come to save the world and not to judge it. I grew up uh, with three sisters, one older, two younger. Uh, when we were kids, my mom was, was more of like a stay-at-home mom, and she took care of us during the day. And my dad would work all day, and then he would come home, which meant there was a window of time, allegedly, this is all alleged, between, between school and my dad coming home where my mom was responsible for four kids under 12. And of the four, there was one that had a, like, a, a penchant for doing things that they, I won't gender, because, uh, that they should not have Every day I would find my mom's last nerve and then I would just like, and just dance with it every day. And every once in a while, something would happen that I thought would impact eternity for me. She would say, why don't you go to your room? I'd say, bet, that's where my toys are, that's fine. <laughs> and wait for your dad to get home. No joke, guys, there's one time I put on 10 pairs of underwear waiting for my dad to get home. <laughs> it didn't help. <laughs> but I'd sit there, and I would wait to hear the Dodge Ram pull in the drive. I'd wait to hear the five minutes of pregnant pause, and then I would wait to hear the slow march up 20 stairs that were on the other side of my door as what I assumed to be the executioner came to deliver the sentence. <laughs> and growing up, all I thought was like, man, I'm tired of getting punished. Man, I'm tired of getting grounded. Man, I'm tired of getting spanked. I've had enough. And I just viewed my dad, when my mom would say, just wait for your dad to get home, as the one to carry out the sentence for my misdoings. My perspective was so off. And I think for a lot of us, our perspective on Jesus is so off. My dad didn't drive home from Paxton Lumber Company smelling like sawdust, hoping that I screwed up bad enough to get punished that day. My dad never came home thinking about how much he loves judging me. I like to think, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, that he came home just thinking about how much he loved me. <laughs> you suck. That's, that's my dad. <laughs> See, like, if we could just look past ourselves, we could realize that Jesus illuminating the light in your life, illuminating the darkness in your life, is not because he can't wait to tell you how stupid you are. He can see that from a more comfortable place. He wants to illuminate the dark because he loves you so much. He cares about you so much. In these verses, Jesus is saying, like, oh, look, I never came here to condemn the darkness. I came here to provide an alternative to it. And I think this morning, really quick sidebar before we get back to our scheduled close, it's important that we make a distinction that when Jesus said, I will not judge, he's telling us, you will not judge either. If, if you've been sitting in the light for four decades, that's so much so that you've got a great base coat of a tan going on, you should realize your job now isn't to condemn those that aren't with you yet. Your job is to find them. 
Your job's to be the light that you are hoping for, that you have experienced for so long. And I think for some of us, like, if we're not careful, we see that and we're burned by that, ironically. And so we don't ever approach the light. We believe that the existence of the light is to reveal what's wrong with us. Some of us come into church every week thinking about what could possibly be wrong with me. And Jesus is saying, that's not why the light exists. I, I think we just need to clarify really quickly that the heart of Jesus is to save your heart. <laughs> Imagine coming to earth and living for 33 years and then dying in like an excruciatingly painful way just to say, I'm really glad you didn't choose me because I wanted to judge you so hard. <laughs> That's absurd. But we think that way anyway. We tell ourselves that I can't approach the light because God knows my darkness and it's too dark. Can I tell you there's no such thing as too dark? I will give you two examples. One, when Jesus is being crucified, when Jesus is experiencing excruciating pain, he looks at the crowd of people that are in front of him that are responsible for that pain. And you know what he says? So glad you're here. Now it's a chance for me to judge you. No. He prays to God that God would forgive them. He sees an absurd amount of darkness in front of his face. And he says, God, please, they don't get it. They don't understand what they're doing. Please forgive them before they can ask for forgiveness. Second example, the only lucky person to have ever been crucified in recorded history. Guy's being crucified on one side of Jesus and he sees everything that's going on and he looks over at Jesus and he says, wow, you really are the son of God. And Jesus looks over at him and he says, probably deserved what you're on the cross for. So hell's really hot. all I needed. I don't care why you're next to me right now. We're going to die and I'll see you in a minute. Church, the dark doesn't matter. Your darkness doesn't matter. There is no too dark. There is no too far gone. When you look, so we've gone through like 12 chapters of the book of John, right? And Jesus has encountered a lot of people and he's healed a lot of people. They came to Jesus because they had something wrong that they needed to get taken care of and they believed that Jesus could meet their tangible need. And then they took off and told everybody. Some guy's friends lowered him reverse crane game style into a crowded room because they believed in Jesus so much that our friend who is about to die can be healed by this man. This guy passed out in a massive room full of people is lowered down in front of Jesus. Jesus says, get up, what are you doing? And the guy gets up, leaves, never comes back. You think he doesn't tell anybody? Pretty sure people would get tired of hearing this story. A wee little tax collector goes up into a tree because he thinks this Jesus guy is legit, but he doesn't want to get too close. And Jesus says, hey, why are you up there? Get down from there. We're going to go have dinner. And this guy has one encounter with Jesus and is never the same. And the next day goes and starts paying back with interest everyone that he had scammed and robbed for years. Church, your darkness is irrelevant. What is relevant is what you do with the light once it's revealed. You wanna, you wanna break your pain? Use it. We've got 
a few people in this church that have had to go through the unfortunate process of divorce. And now, they walk through other people who are in that same thing. I've seen it firsthand. They say, God illuminated my pain, my darkness, and now I trust in him. I give it to him. Why? So he can do something with it. So that he can change someone else's life through what he's doing in your life. We've got a lot of people who have lost a loved one. We've got some people who have experienced the pain of miscarriage. I can't pretend to know how bad that has to hurt. But I'm telling you, if you will trust Jesus, if you can trust Jesus, if you're willing to trust Jesus, he'll say, I know, I get it. But there's someone else that this just happened to, and they need to know there's another side. Guys, we've got, like... By where my parents live, down near Sugar Creek, there's a massive sign advertising to never do heroin alone. Because if you overdose, there's no one there to help you. And the first time I read that, I got angry. I said, why is this in my city? But after like two weeks, because it wasn't, it wasn't quick, I realized there's a lot of people that need a light in this city. There are people that are so lost, the only reason they're going to someone else is so they don't die. What if you were the light? What if we trusted in the light? I haven't preached in, I think like six months, six months plus maybe, I don't know. I've been going through like some crazy deconstruction and like some really messy analyzing of what I believe. And, and out of it, in the middle of it, I said, I can't preach because I can't say something on stage if I don't believe it. One thing came out of that. Jesus is real. I'm figuring the rest out, maybe. We can do it together. If you wanna watch wrestling at my house, we can talk about Jesus too. <laughs> Your youth pastor stood on stage not but a month ago, talking about three times he attempted suicide. And he didn't do that, so people would be like, man, dude, you're so brave, bro. Now, anyone that is mired in darkness in this church knows, where's Andrew? I can talk to Andrew. Andrew has walked through this and come out the other side. So my question for you, are you willing to allow Jesus to illuminate your darkness? Are you willing to trust Jesus with the parts of yourself that you don't love? The parts of yourself that are hurting and aching and broken, self-inflicted or outside afflicted, either way. As we take communion together, I want you to think about that. Are you willing to trust Jesus? And if you are, what are you gonna do with that? God, I pray that you would be with your church this morning. We know that you're here. I pray that, that your conviction would look like what it needs to look like. God, I pray that as your people draw towards the light, as your people draw towards Jesus, we wouldn't do it out of fear, but we would do it out of freedom. That we would realize that you love us so much that no darkness deserves any hold in our life. That it is only your light. Be with your people now. Please. Amen.